Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Tiny Fit Diva podcast. I'm your host, Kylene Turkine, functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and I'm very, very excited to welcome Diana Lane to the show today, so thank you so much for being here. Yay. Thanks, Kylene. I'm super excited to share today. So I love how much you are focused on energy and emotion and stress relief because I think that is such a key part to healing. So let me give uh, our audience a little bit of an intro for you. Diana Lane is a stress reduction specialist and holistic health expert, a pre-med heart surgeon turned acupuncturist, herbalist, and reiki master. With over 17 years of experience, she specializes in women's wellness, specifically adrenal fatigue, stress, cycle issues, insomnia, and cosmetic acupuncture, and has a private practice in an integrative clinic in Austin, Texas. That's so much. I love it. So can you share, because... What really I think stands out to me and probably anyone listening is you were a pre-med going into heart surgery with focus on heart surgery and now you're into this sort of holistic wellness and integrative care. So can you share your story and how did you, what was your journey? How did you come from one to the other? Yeah, absolutely. I always say that I'm the perfect blend of science and woo. You know, my journey started when I was really young. I was in the ballet industry growing up and I was really unhealthy. I mean, the body dysmorphia, the eating disorders. And, you know, I was like 16, 17 years old and recognized that my breakfast of champions, the Doritos and Dr. Pepper that I was eating in high school was probably not serving me well. So I dove into nutrition. I was like, oh my gosh, okay, let's start healing this body. And I got really into nutrition and quickly realized that that probably wasn't where I was going to find my true path. And so I decided to become a doctor. And as I started looking into what that meant, obviously heart surgeon, I want to save the world. I want to heal hearts. I want to just help people. And um, that empathic side of me was like, yes, let's do this. Cardiothoracic surgery for the win. So I was in my pre-med program about three years into my undergrad, and I got into the cardiac rehab internship. Now, my goal was to transfer to University of Washington, which is a great feeder school for Stanford and Yale and some of the other Ivy Leagues, and gung-ho. And about two weeks in, I started recognizing that something was not lining up. People would come in with two or three stints in their hearts, their second coronary artery bypass, and they're in this rehab program and, you know, reeking like booze and cigarettes, throwing their McDonald's cup out on the way in. I'm like, so can I talk to them about these lifestyle habits? What about fruits, vegetables, and water? And they basically looked at me and said, that's not your job. Get them on the machines make sure they're taking their prescriptions, take their vitals and send them on their way. And I'm such a sap. I would go home crying at night, just like totally disheveled after these experiences. And I started asking more questions. Well, you know, how many people come back? And they were like, well, we have about 60 to 70 people come back. 70% of people come back within the first two years. I said, well, okay, what are survival rates? And it just got worse and worse and worse. And the more I learned, the less it made sense. Quickly, it became clear as day that that was not how I was going to save the world because that was my mission at the time. And so I started looking into everything. I looked into Ayurveda, naturopathy, physical therapy, OT, chiropractic, and acupuncture was the one that made the most sense. The more I learned, the more it became clear that this was a comprehensive medical system based on 5,000 years of efficacy and use and it has withstood the test of time and it made so much sense i mean our environment our emotions our food our water the type of music we surround ourselves the colors that we wear all of these things can affect our own health and wellness and our frequency so once i had this epiphany that was it i was like chinese medicine for the win i quickly shifted from my pre-med program and got my kinesiology background for my undergrad and then spent three and a half years in my master's program, traveled from China to Thailand, spent three and a half months in Southeast Asia, studied with the monks in Wudong and did Tai Chi and Qigong, went to the hospitals in Guangzhou and got to study with the physicians there and it just solidified my path and it's been a beautiful journey since. Oh my gosh, what, what a journey. How cool is that? That you traveled and got to study with everyone? That's amazing. 
I knew I had to get back to my roots, you know, being in the American system of Chinese medicine, they have brought over so much of the ancient practices, but I knew like I needed to go and see it firsthand. And was yeah, what a difference that made, I'm sure. And I mean, a lot of people in the States practice uh, acupuncture, but not a lot practice herbalism along with that, mm -hmm. which I find really interesting because my understanding is really that traditionally they go together. They do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and in the traditional sense, a lot of times uh, practitioners will sometimes specialize. So in the Chinese medical hospitals, there are some routes that go more in the acupuncture realm. Like I was looking into doing a doctorate there and you almost specialize either in herbalism or acupuncture or research. And so there's kind of these different aspects where while all the practitioners do both of them, there are people who specialize in more one than the other. Mm. So you mentioned some really interesting things, and I kind of like to ask you about them. You were talking about energy and colors and emotion. Can you talk about uh, the impact that that might have on people's health and vitality? And um, yeah, just just talk, just touch on that a little bit. Absolutely. Go I in any direction you want. <laughs> I love that. I love talking about these kind of aspects because what you'll notice yourself is you probably have a favorite color. You have colors that you really like, that you love to wear, or that you look at and you're like, oof, that does not make me feel great. And so in Chinese medicine, the colors are typically associated with different organs. So similar to the chakra systems, red is for the heart, not quite the same as the chakra system, but red is the color of the heart. Green is the color of the liver. Yellow is the color of the stomach. And blue or black is the color of the kidneys. And so these are resonant colors that are associated with healing energies for these organs. And so um, it goes a little further into elements and so forth. So green, liver, spring, wood, those are all a container of similar aspects of the element of the liver and wood. However, you can not only use these colors to heal you by like drawing in a red light into your heart, drawing in a green light into your liver or a yellow light into the spleen, but also the colors that surround us. So they all have different frequencies. They all have different resonant wavelengths. And those wavelengths, just like us, because we are atoms and molecules and protons and neutrons and electrons, we're just energy. Colors are energy. So something like a purple light, they say, which is one of the highest frequencies of light, can have a really profound healing effect purple and gold being some of the strongest healing colors. And you'll see this throughout the ages, the colors of royalty. I was just going to say, yeah, purple. Right. yeah, purple and gold usually go together. Yeah. Yep. And so there's something to that. And what it really is, is it's this frequency and wavelength of the benefit that those colors have to you. And so there are whole trains of thought. We don't go too, too deep into that because we're learning 5 million other things and half of it's in Chinese. But the colors are something that we do expand upon in our practice. And I use purple and gold a lot for healing and that guided light meditation, which can be really soothing. It's all frequency, all energy. That's so interesting. So, um, you, you know, a lot of this probably seems very new and very different and very foreign to a lot of people. Um, and I know probably five, six, seven years ago, I would have thought, oh, that's crazy. She's crazy, you know, but the more I learn about how the body works and the more I experiment with things and the more I experience things, the more I really do think that energy is really, and understanding it is really crucial to the healing journey. And I think that's why stress affects you so tremendously. And, uh, you know, you're talking about these different connections between color. And the one thing that always stood out to me that I thought was fascinating about Chinese medicine was the organ clock uh -huh. and how, and, and, and how, you know, your organs are you know, more or less active at different times during the day and how accurate that can be. And you're like, oh man, I'm feeling really tired. And it's like two to three in the afternoon. What's going on? And you look at the organ chart and you're like, oh, maybe I should support this organ. And you feel better. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's kind of crazy. And it blows my mind, like you're saying, I mean, the fact that, you know, two to 5,000 years ago, the awareness of these cultures in respect to nature and reverence for the body, they learn by observation. And when everybody in society is tired at 2 p.m., they're like, 
oh, let's talk about this. Right. And one thing that popped into my mind, I forgot to mention about colors. This is not super nebulous. If you look at companies, and I hate to even say the word, companies like McDonald's, they use red and yellow because those stimulate hunger. A company like Orange Theory, which is an incredible, like, high, they, something weird is going on with my phone. There we are. So um, these other companies like Orange Theory, you know, orange is a color of confidence. It's a color of determination. It's a color of like getting things done. And so even in modern day society and marketing, they're using color because color stimulates certain things in your brain and your body and can make you feel hungry, can make you feel tired when you're feeling blue. It's literally the effect of the color of that sensation of calmness and kind of a little bit of downtime. So smart stuff. I know. It's so, lineage, oh but my gosh. Modern day. Super fascinating. So um, you have your uh, holistic healing company is, is called Moon Medicine Magic. So what made you choose that name in particular? You know, it's funny because when I got out of school, I had that typical, like I wanted to be everything for everyone. I was going to move to the mountains and be a sports medicine doctor and do all this stuff. And I call my company Epic Acupuncture because it's going to be epic. And I was going to help everybody. And then I realized that I was doing both myself and my community a disservice by not specializing in what really calls me. And so when I started really diving into my heart and soul, like, what do I want to do? Who am I here to serve? And while I can treat a variety of things and people from childhood to adulthood and every walk of life, it became really clear that women's health and wellness was it for me. So supporting the sacredness of cycles and sisterhood was so clear as day. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. Who do I want to work with? I want to work with powerful women on their journey, looking for, you know, healing guidance. I say, I'm not a healer. I'm here to guide you on your healing journey. And then I started refining like, okay, so epic acupuncture, like probably not for the late ladies. And I dug a little bit deeper and got a pretty significant download. My name is Diana and Diana in Roman mythology is the goddess of the moon and the hunt. I'm like, okay, well, that's obvious. Let's go down that pathway. And then I was like, okay, so moon and then like moon medicine and then talking about cycles that seemed really just applicable. Like, okay, obviously moon medicine. And I struggled a lot with using the word magic. So in my practice, it's moon medicine healing arts because it's brick and mortar. And in my life and in my website and what I'm doing, it's moon medicine magic. And I talked for a long time with people about this, like, Ooh, like magic. Not everyone believes in that. And you know, what, what exactly am I implying here? And what I realized is that it's fine if you don't believe in magic and we're probably not a good fit for each other to work together long-term because there is magic in everyday life. I mean, electricity. <laughs> I know how we're connecting right now. <laughs> right? Like this is so magical. And then these divine connections on all this stuff. And it's like, you know, I realized that it would be a little polarizing and that that's okay. And so moon medicine magic, because it really is a testament to my path and my journey and my reverence for cycles and sisterhood. And then, you know, there's magic to be found everywhere. So that, that kind of stuck and I couldn't believe it didn't exist already. I was like, website, LLC, assume name, done. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook group, set. <laughs> so let's talk about cycles because we've, um, we've talked about hormones a lot on this podcast and people kind of follow my own journey on, uh, you know, healing my own hormones and working on, on that. And I'm sort of like constantly on the journey of tweaking and, you know, working and growing and learning. And I think a lot of women go through different phases where their cycles will be too short or they'll be too long or they'll be painful and then they won't be. And, and they have just a lot of inconsistency. I know for me, I think two realizations I've had recently, one, a few nutrient deficiencies can go, uh, can help a long way when they're corrected. And two, stress, I feel like is the major impact for me. The more stressed I am in a month, the more off kilter my cycle might be. So can you maybe talk about some common things that you run into? Are, I mean, are those it? Or um, do you see some other ones more pronounced than that? 
Yeah. So it's really varietal. And this is why I love being in the healing space because like right when I think like, oh my gosh, I've seen so much, something totally off the wall comes. I'm like, okay, now I think I've seen it all. But, um, and I know I haven't, I know that's not the truth, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, one thing I've recognized is that we are not taught to understand what a normal cycle looks like. The sex education in school is a far cry from what we actually need to be educated on. And most women think it's normal to be crippled over in pain, nauseous, heavy bleeding, clots, um, you know, totally like irritable and grumpy, you know, feeling like it's the end of the world. Whatever those symptoms are, uh, we think that that's normal because that maybe is your normal or at one point was my normal to have pretty bad cramps and clots. And then you go to the doctors and they're like, here, take some birth control and take this for the rest of your life. And you can take it all the way through your cycle. So you don't even get your cycle. And it's like, wait a minute, like this is supposed to be happening. And so I see everything from just basic hormonal imbalances. Like you're saying, Kylene, stress is a huge factor in this because stress affects cortisol and what cortisol does. So at the top of the cascade of hormones, you have pregnenolone and DHEA and kind of some of these precursors that become estrogen and testosterone and all of the other estradiols and so forth. But what happens is when you're in a heightened state constantly and you're stressed all the time, cortisol will circumvent that whole cascade and it's called the pregnenolone steel. And what cortisol does is it goes and it grabs pregnenolone and it starts scavenging for pregnenolone, which is the precursor for all of our healthy hormones. And then you end up with a pretty severe imbalance just from stress and cortisol alone. So a lot of times they can be course corrected by figuring out ways to manage stress and manage cortisol. However, there's other dysfunctions, the hypothalamic pituitary access. So the conversation between our brain and our adrenals and our pituitary gland can affect this, as well as the billions of endocrine disruptors we experience on a daily basis. I was just talking about this the other day. Like, ladies, if you have blade plugins in your house or anything like that, take those out and throw them in the garbage. It is literally like carcinogenic toxins in your air. On top of some of the foods we eat, the things that we're surrounded by, our dryer sheets, our soaps, there are a million things that can affect you on a daily basis. And if you are not looking at your toxic trade-offs is what I call them, looking into your soaps and your cosmetics and your um, you know, deodorant and things like that all of those can have an effect on your hormones. And so that can create minor problems like cycles being short and long, how much food you're eating, how much stress you're going through. And then there's stuff on the other end of the spectrum. One of my patients, and this was the like, whoa, I think I've seen it all. She has two cervixes, two uteruses, and two, like, like her, she has like a two of everything. I'm like, wow. They don't teach us about that. <laughs> what the heck? What happened here? Yeah. And was she like a twin that, that blended or something at birth? That's what I was thinking. You know, the doctors don't have a lot of descriptions. They say it's a rare genetic disposition. They don't have a lot. But consequently, she was having two cycles. She was bleeding most of the month. Poor girl. Right. And she comes in and they put her on birth control and all this stuff. And she's in this whole cascade now trying to get married and so forth. And like afraid of breaking out and going crazy. And I had her come in and I was like, look. I'm going to be honest with you, three months to manage expectations, three months minimum to really see the changes. I believe and know that we can moderate this and mitigate and regulate, but I said three months and we're now two months in. She has had one cycle each month, no problems, no period issues, no PMS, no breakouts. Her skin looks amazing and she is so excited for her wedding and that just blows my mind. Be like, That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. What would you say would be like the biggest needle for her? Was it nutrition? Was it lifestyle? Was it just a combination of things? I think really, you know, nutrition wise, she's a yoga and Pilates instructor. She does a lot to really take good care of herself. It really boiled down to some of the herbal supplementation and the acupuncture components. Mm. So acupuncture can be really incredible to help your body reappropriate what it's already got. And then the supplements and the herbs actually add and subtract substrates. So 
for her, she had some clots and stuff like that. So we were getting the blood moving using things like Dangwe, Angelica, to get the blood not only boosted, but to get it to move more smoothly. So hers was a little multifaceted approach for sure. That's amazing. That's amazing. That just has to make you feel so good. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I was like, oh, God, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. And, you know, the yeah. first month was like, yes. And then now we're two months in. And I'm like, yes. Yay, so that that's feels so really cool. That's so cool. So let's talk about stress. Are there, can you give us maybe one or two stress relieving techniques? I know acupuncture can be very helpful for that as well. Yes, absolutely. And there are really basic things that can support you in de-stressing. And I do, of course, recommend finding things that you like. Now, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I go and I work out stress and I like work out really hard and work it out. <laughs> great to an extent, but you're actually stressing your body and putting it in a sympathetic state when you're in that fight or flight, when you're working really hard. So I highly recommend downloading, if you haven't already, the Insight Timer, like Intellectual Insight Timer app. It's a free app, or it might be 99 cents for the full version or something like that, but they have guided meditations. I've been doing a lot of research. Like I said, I'm a total science mind. I've been doing a lot of research on meditation, and they're actually finding that you can increase the neural folds, the gyrification, they call it, in your brain, and that people who meditate, they studied brains of 50-year-old meditators, and they had the neurological capacity of 25-year-olds. Wow meditate. Even if it feels like you're not doing it right, you cannot meditate wrong. The practice is in your mind wandering away a million times and bringing it back to your breath. So I recommend guided meditation. Start with five minutes because when I say 15 to 30, people look at me like I'm Medusa. Start. I know exactly that phase. Ah, I'm like five minutes to start. And what you'll find is you're like, oh, I could do five more. Maybe I could do 15 and the guided meditations give you something to anchor. So do the guided meditations and find something peaceful, whether that's walking in nature, taking a bath, um, you know, just doing something like yoga nidra. I really love the yoga for stress management and yoga nidra classes, AKA yoga napping and breath work. I mean, just breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth can be a really calming breath. And so I highly recommend finding things like that, that give you a little bit more downtime to de-stress as opposed to like the active outlet of it, which is great too. Don't get me wrong. I love me some hard workouts, but I also need that downtime. Yeah. You have to find the balance. I think it's interesting because in just generally speaking, I feel like people are much more willing to go to the gym and do something really hard and basically kill themselves <laughs> for an hour than they are to sometimes make lifestyle changes or try something calming like meditation. And it's like, oh, I don't need that. And uh, what we end up finding out is we're burning ourselves out. And we're actually doing the opposite of what we intend by going to the gym and we're making ourselves worse. I think, I think women have a hard time relaxing sometimes. I agree. And especially with the shift in society where women are working and tending to lifestyle things that we can really tend to overdo it. And, you know, adrenal fatigue, whether or not it's fully proven by science or not yet, it's a thing. And you can feel it when it starts to kind of insidiously step into your life and you don't feel like yourself anymore. And that, of course, taxes the hormones and taxes your energy levels and it can, it can take a while. You got to honor this temple, you know? Yeah. We got to slow down and listen to it and, and learn how to do that effectively. So how important, I think I know the answer to this, but how important do you think it is to incorporate the spiritual, energetic, and emotional side of things versus just um, focusing on the physical aspect of healing. Cause we can learn a lot. And I mean, I work with functional lab testing and I like to test don't guess. So we know what we're working on, but we also do focus on, you know, lifestyle and stress and things like that, because I think it's so combined. Do you think that you can really achieve complete physical healing without addressing some of those other things? Yeah. So this is a great question, Kylene, because we are in a day and age where I believe that the biggest detriment to modern medicine was the separation of mind and body. Once we pulled psychology out of like the physical medical field, 
I believe that we lost a lot of the true nature of healing because this and this and all of this is one being. It's all connected. And so while some people can easily stay in that physical realm and do healing on a physical level and kind of just be in that kind of like earthly plane, which is totally fine, not everyone's always ready to step into the spiritual and the emotional work, but it is a comprehensive system. You have to heal from the inside out and the outside in. So in my mind, they are one and the same. You cannot get the physical healing done if you're not going to do the mental and the emotional and spiritual work, because this aspect of, of being, of truly being, is one head to toe, heaven to earth, whatever it is you want to say, we are one being. And so it really does take a multifaceted approach. And I do something called esoteric acupuncture, also known as spiritual acupuncture. I was just which, to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Share. Which is so good. It, it really, it steps into what we call like that fifth dimensional healing. So it works on a higher energetic plane. And I've worked with people, uh, I have a great story about this. When I was in clinic, actually, at a woman, severe trauma. I mean, childhood trauma through a lot of her life, some really horrible abuse. And, and you could see it, like they call it the Shen. You could see it in the light in her eyes. Like it was like dimmed and she was holding on to all of this pain and all of this trauma, very much PTSD kind of symptoms. And we were doing all this physical work, healing her gut and getting all these other things going and, you know, getting some leeway, some leeway, some gains. And one day I pulled in an esoteric acupuncture treatment and I learned a very valuable lesson with this. We harmonized the heart and the kidneys, which are our source of love and our source of fear. And so we released her fear so she could step into love, loving kindness. And I did this treatment on her and you know, I'm seeing her every week and she comes back a week later and she looks like a completely different person. I mean, like eyes bright, smile on her face. Like she looked like she had like anti-age, like 10 years. Like she had taken like 10 years off of her life. And I'm like, Hey, like what, how, how are you doing? You know? And she goes, I have to be honest with you, Diana. She says, after that treatment, I didn't know if I was going to come back. She said, I spent three days in turmoil, like unraveling devastation, just like end of the world kind of stuff. She says, and then something clicked and shifted and I felt a transition in my heart and in my digestive system. She says all, she was having really severe digestive dysfunction. She said the rest of the week, I haven't had a single problem with my digestion. She says, I feel human again. She says, it's like the clouds parted and the sun came out. And so I learned to tell people with esoteric acupuncture, it will give you exactly what you need, what you're prepared to handle. Because as you start to blossom and you start to pull apart the layers, things are going to come to the surface. And when the hard stuff comes up, it means you're ready for it. It means you're ready to process it and deal with it. And so I always tell people it's going to give you exactly what you need to process. And it's going to help you sort through the underlying emotional and spiritual aspects of who you are so that you can go to your comfort zone and transcend to the next level. That's the true healing. Transcending. That is so interesting and also a little terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was like, in clinic, like, oh my God, I just rocked this woman's world. Like, oh. So good lesson. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Um, that's just so interesting. So is it typically, I mean, in terms of the appointment, is it like a normal acupuncture appointment? I, I mean, yeah, for whatever a normal acupuncture appointment would be like, the, there are specific patterns that you use. So there are some called chakra balancing systems because it's based on the Kabbalah and Zohar and esoteric arts and sacred geometry. It's got a very comprehensive system behind it. So the patterns are very specific and there are visualizations that go with it and the points go in one way and come out the opposite way. So it's 
a little bit more methodical of a container than say a traditional Chinese medicine treatment where I'm like, oh, we're working with blood. So I'll put liver eight in a point that supports the movement and the nourishment of blood. This one's a little more like this is the preset pattern for harmonizing the heart and kidneys or balancing the root chakra, or there's one called soul journey and pattern of truth that I really like to use. And they're really cool. And people go through amazing things. I mean, I've had ancestors visit patients on the table. I've had lights, I've had colors. And, and on the other side, I've had like, oh yeah, okay, that was cool. You know, so it, it's really whatever you're ready for, but it's a little different than a regular acupuncture session. Okay. But Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I had never heard of that before. So thank you for explaining that. What an, what an interesting addition to, a, to the acupuncture practice. So that's really cool because you are um, combining so many different things. So you can kind of help people from a, a whole life perspective, which I think is super important. Yeah. yeah, it really is. You know, that lifestyle modification, like what you're doing, Kylene, I mean, it's great to have functional lab analysis because numbers are so powerful. And then like you, you know, you take it to this whole other level where it does take more than just eating right and exercising, you know, to, th those are excellent. And if you're not doing those, you probably won't get the other stuff done as well. But Yeah, it all works together. Exactly. Yeah, you have to have, I really do. I'm, I'm, it's, it's funny because for a long time, I think I really just depended on that on nutrition and lifestyle. And I think in the past year, maybe even less than that, maybe the past six months or so, I've just really started settling into know if your stress is not in check and you maybe have some emotional trauma or, you know, things that you're dealing with that you haven't processed through who knows what adult situations or childhood issues or whatever it is. Those are as important to identify and work through as stop eating at McDonald's. <laughs> right, right. That's and so I really true. feel like they have to work together. Yeah. yeah. Emotions can absolutely create disease. I mean, for sure, when you hold on to your traumas and they're studying this, even in the modern medical Western world, how our emotions affect our physiology, how they affect our genetic lineages. They're saying we have 14 generations of genetic imprints on our DNA. And so we are still processing this stuff. And I found that when you get the mind, body, lifestyle, and then you start doing that inner child work, and you start doing the core wounds work of not feeling enough and things like that, that that's when you get those like next levels of breakthroughs. So I love yeah. that you're pioneering that. <laughs> so you have a moon medicine magic course that, that's mm. coming up. Can you talk about that? What all is involved and how do people find it? Yeah. So I launched the moon medicine magic retreat program. So it's all about the sacredness of cycles and sisterhood. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a space for both transformation, if that's what you want, or refinement, because not everyone wants to completely transform who they are. And so in this course, it's a three month program with a retreat. So we dive deep into some of what's going on, what's normal, what's not. We have a group component as well as a one-on-one -on -one component. And there's a lot of beautiful tips and tricks to help women feel like they have a support system, feel like they have a clear idea of what to do because there's a lot of misinformation out there and how to bring in this mind, body, spirit approach. So we'll be diving into supplements and foods and what I call the queen's bath and having all of these different skills, essential oils, different yoga techniques, um, as well as just some of the historical information about how we got to where we are, what's going on with our cycles and why. And then either at the beginning or the end, because this will be an ongoing thing throughout the next couple of years, you can come to a beautiful retreat. And the first one was a day long retreat. In the future, we're probably going to do overnight and three day retreats where you really get to dive into this just luscious, nourishing goddess energy and step into your fierce feminine power and know what's going on in your body and have the tools so that you can change and create the change in your life around your cycles and sisterhood every day. So where can people find you and where can they uh, check out the course? Do you have a website yeah. or social media that they can bug you at? <laughs> totally. So I make it pretty easy. My website okay. is moonmedicinemagic.com. 
You can also find me on Facebook through Moon Medicine Magic or the group, which is called the Sacred Cycles Sisterhood. And if you just want to be friends and talk or you have questions, you can add me, Diana Lane. That's D-I-A-N-A-L-A-N-E. And uh, if you want to email me, moonmedicinemagic at gmail. Make it really streamlined, all of those good things. I'm an open book. I love chatting about this stuff. And we'll be creating monthly meetups locally in Austin. And the goal is to launch this nationally and internationally so that the sisterhood can rise together and we can support each other and not feel so shamed and taboo talking about things like our periods and about <laughs> things like very true you know All it's right. like, oh, you know it's like no screw that paradigm let's talk about it because we need to because we have to heal that and the more you do the more normalized it is i mean it's it's your body it's part of life and there is something about it that's like the first time you talk to someone it's almost like you're whispering <laughs> uh-huh and then you get more used to it. And you're like, no, nah. you know, it's so funny because, you know, doing what I do, I'm like now sharing on social media. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do the Dutch test and I have to um, monitor my ovulation because then, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, the duration of my cycle and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh my gosh, four years ago, are you kidding me? I would have talked about that at all. I would have been so embarrassed. Wow. But it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. And so thank you for all the work that you do help, first of all, helping women but also kind of normalizing, being able to learn about your body and talk about it and, um, you know, heal it. And thank you for your sincerity in, uh, in, in work that you do. I love it, Kylie. Meeting women like you and the tribe that you've created is so incredible just to know that, you know, there is hope and there are women like us who are really pioneering the way so that we can heal the feminine and heal the issues that have come up where we feel like, oh, I had a woman told me she feels like a leper during her cycle. And I was like, oh, sweetheart, let's change this. So honored to be here. Thank you for doing what you do as well. And I can't wait to interview you next week. Or <laughs> Yay. Thanks so much for being here today, Diana. All right, Kylene. Thanks, ladies. Great talking to you.